Well, hey, let me ask, how many of you guys like to hike? Anybody here hikers out there? Okay, got a lot of hikers. I grew up hiking. Um, I love it, getting out into nature, visiting a lot of national parks. And there was one time where um, uh, my family and my brother and his kids, sister and her kids, we were all um, camping in Zion National Park. And uh, there's, a, there's a hike there that is supposed to be one of the most strenuous, dangerous hikes in the nation. And I thought, that's for us. So, so I, I told everybody about the hike. So we're all ready to go. What we were going to hike up is, uh, is a big rock called Angel's Landing. That's it. Yeah, it's pretty intense. It rises up from a canyon floor about 1,500 feet. And, and so I, I talked everybody into going on this hike with me, okay? Um, so we started, and we didn't quite realize that our hike was going to be pretty much vertical. Let me show you what the trail looked like. Yeah, see that? I mean, we were just hiking right up the face of a canyon. And, and then when you get through that part and you're exhausted, then you hit these switchbacks. Look at that. Those are crazy. I mean, now, apparently, some former uh, park superintendent named Walter helped build that. That was his brainchild back who knows when. And so they called those switchbacks Walter's Wiggles. That's like insult to injury, man. I got halfway up those suckers, and I'm just, I had other words for Walter that I can't say in church. But, man, it was hard, so we're all huffing it up there. We get to the top. And then we can see the narrow pathway to get to the top of Angel's Landing. Let me show you what that looks like. Now, look at how narrow that is. All right? And when we went, that nice little chain there wasn't there. So that path is about like, seriously, like about this big. It's not that big. And you have over a 1,000 feet of drop. One, one false move, and you're going to meet your maker. You know what I mean? So, so we get up, and we're looking at that, and I look back at, at you know, my, the, there's the, the brothers, the sisters, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins. I'm like, hey, guys, you ready? And they're looking at me like, uh-uh. You know, Uncle Jim, you are crazy. We're all going out there. I thought, well, let's pray. They're like, that's not going to help. You know, we're, we are not going out there. So I was able to talk, you know, two or three of them to come with me, and we walk out on that, on that narrow ledge. I hope the others were interceding for us, because, I mean, we made it, and when you get to the top of Angel's Landing, let me show you, you've got this beautiful view of the canyon. See, see, look at that young girl. She was up there. She found Jesus. Boy, she's just excited. She made it to the top, right? And you get that, that beautiful view and that accomplishment that, man, I just, did, I just did an incredible hike. Well, this morning, I want to share with you a, another pathway. Another pathway that I think has some similarities to this path up to Angel's Landing. It, it's not an easy pathway. It can be really challenging. Uh, there's a cost involved. And we might ask, ask ourselves, you know, is it really worth it? Do I really want to go down this pathway? It seems risky. Hmm. Well, I want to encourage you. It's a pathway worth taking. It's a pathway that David took. And I've taken it before. And I pray that by the time we're done today, God will have touched your hearts. And you'll want to start on this pathway. And it's called the path to forgiveness. If you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago in our study on the life of David through uh, First and Second Samuel, David had just committed uh, sin with Bathsheba. A woman who wasn't his wife, adultery was involved, and cover up. He had her husband murdered on the battlefield. Um, all these things were going on. And, uh, and David never went public with it. And this went on for, for about a year. But God loved David. 
even though their relationship had been strained because of his sin. And you know what? God loves us. Even when that relationship is strained by our disobedience. And so we're going to look at, uh, at the follow-up story to David's sin and how he chose to take that first step on the path to forgiveness. Let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We say we love you, and yet sometimes we disobey you. We battle with that, that godly spiritual nature you've given us, and yet there's that there's that nature, that fleshly nature that wants us to do our own thing. Lord, you want us to be right with you. You want us to walk with you in our thoughts, in our words, in our attitudes, in our actions. Lord, I pray that, that you would speak to us today and learn this lesson that David gives us. In your name we pray, amen. Well, first off, the path to forgiveness prepares our hearts through conviction. So if you have your note sheets out, I'd encourage you to follow along. The path to forgiveness prepares our hearts through conviction. Now, as I mentioned, nearly a year had passed since David's sin with Bathsheba, the murder of her husband Uriah, and yet he still hadn't done business with God. He hadn't confessed anything publicly, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't getting torn up inside. I don't know about you, but when I have um, just an attitude of disobedience in me or, or unconfessed sin, it, it grates on me. It tears me up inside. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And he's constantly telling me, hey, we got to do business with God. Come on. Now, let me show you. I think we have a little insight in the book of Psalms. Remember, David wrote many of them, and he writes in Psalm 32, and I, I think this probably had something to do with his, uh, his sin with Bathsheba and murder. He says this in verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. So as David hid that sin, it was affecting him, both physically uh, and emotionally. He was hurting. And then it goes on in verse 4, For day and night your hand, O Lord, was heavy upon me. See, God loved David. God loves you and I. And, and if we've trusted Jesus as our Savior, as Holy Spirit is working within us, and, and God will just gently put his hands on us. Saying, hey, we're out of alignment here. We need to get back into alignment, my son, my daughter. So, so let's do business together. David was feeling the hand of the Lord upon him when he kept silent about his sin. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Isn't that a that's such a, a poetic description. Many of these psalms were, were put to music, and they were sang. And David is just sharing his heart. It's like, man, when I kept silent, when I kept my sin hidden to myself, when I didn't confess it to God, it hurt me physically, it hurt me emotionally, it hurt me spiritually, and I, I just had no strength. And I think that's how David was feeling. Now, all of that was God's warning sign to David that, hey, my son, something's wrong. <laughs> you know, a while back I was, I was um, driving with one of my daughters in her car, and we're going down the road, and all of a sudden, I hear a knocking, and, and kind of a screech, and kind of a screech. And I, and my daughter and was I, driving. I said, "Did you hear that?" I said, "Did you hear that?" Hear what? I said, "Hear what?" Listen, I said, "There's a listen. knock. There's a knock. And a screech. Something's and wrong a screech. with your car. She Some, goes wrong with your car. Oh, I can get rid of that. I just turn up the stereo." 
I'm all, what? Are you kidding me? Who's your father anyway? I mean, <laughs> when you hear that, that means something's wrong with a That was God um, trying to prepare David's heart through that, that conviction. And so God sent one of David's friends, who also happened to be a prophet, Nathan, to confront David with his sin. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it says this, and the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him. So so David might have been sitting, who knows, maybe he was sitting on his throne. Maybe he was in his throne room. Maybe there were attendants in the room with him, family members. We don't know. But Nathan the prophet got an audience with the king. And he had a message from the Lord to the king. So he said this, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds. Maybe this rich guy had all kinds of herds of goats and sheep. He was, he was wealthy. But the poor man, he had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children, this, this little lamb, Back in that day, sometimes they would take lambs, and, and they were actually pets. And it says how they related to this, this little lamb. It used to eat of his morsel. In other words, he'd get the scraps from the dinner table, eating them out of the master's hand, and, and he'd even drink from his cup. And the little lamb would lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Kind of like your favorite dog, right? You love your dog. <laughs> Not all of us do. I have issues with my dog. But I know some of you guys really love your dog. And you'll feed the dog. You're petting the dog. You walk the dog. You know, it's, it's a whole deal. So, <coughs> Nathan goes on. He says, Now there came a traveler to the rich man. And he was, the rich man was unwilling to take one of his own flock. Remember, he had many, many herds and flocks, of sheep, and goat, and whatever else. But he was unwilling to take one of them to prepare for his guest who had come to him. But what did he do? He took the poor man's little lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Man, that's not okay. And and David's listening to this. And now, now look at his response. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And beyond that, he's going to restore that lamb fourfold to the poor man because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, (coughs) to me, that's an interesting response, don't you think? (coughs) <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm still getting used to Manteca a little bit. <coughs> Boy, I don't know what's in the air out here, but is it almonds? I don't know. Man. So David's hearing this story that Nathan's telling him, and, and he's not getting the hint. <laughs> He's not connecting the dots. I mean, it's kind of coming in loud and clear. But David is thinking this really happened, and he's angry, and he's just given the rich guy the death sentence. Plus, he had to restore four lambs to the poor man. Now, this is my advice to myself, to all of us. Don't let it get that far. (laughs) Don't let it get that far. When God gives us the signals, the warning lights, when his hand is upon us, that's the Holy Spirit convicting us, right? So that we might get back in line with God, that we would enjoy him once again and have that freedom from our sin. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It tells us in the book of John, chapter 16, 
verse 8, that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. If you're a child of God, if you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God Himself indwells within you through the person of the Holy Spirit, right? So, when we act, behave out of line with God's Word, the Holy Spirit's going to give us the warning signal. And the path to forgiveness prepares our hearts through conviction. Now, secondly, it begins when we acknowledge our sin. We begin on that path when we acknowledge our sin. So David has just made this judgment on the rich man that Nathan told him about. But now Nathan has to let David know just exactly what's going on. And he says in verse 7 of chapter 12, and I don't know if he pointed his finger, but it must have been just like a punch in the face to David. Just a punch right in the stomach. And Nathan said, you are the man. You are the man, David. And then, and then he goes on. And he gets, he gets specific. And, and prophetically, Nathan says, Thus says the Lord, friend, king, these aren't just my words. These are God's words to you. And it says, I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you out of the hand of King Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all the tribes of Israel to rule. I gave you all the tribes of Judah to rule. And if this were too little, I would have added to you as much more. God was willing to just give David anything he asked for as God was working through him to lead and to serve his children, Israel. God's like, man, I gave you everything, and if that wasn't enough, I would give you more. I would give you more, David. Verse 9, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil? In his sight, you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you've taken his wife to be your wife, and you've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. God lays it out to David through the prophet Nathan. And remember, about, about a year has gone by. Wow. And then we see David's response. In verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, when we mess up, we don't have to write out a big, long prayer. It can be short and to the point. David simply acknowledges sin. I have sinned against the Lord. He wasn't making excuses for it anymore. He wasn't blaming anybody. He wasn't trying to hide from it. He simply acknowledged his sin. Honestly. I mean, <laughs> you know, in contrast, I think of Adam and Eve, right? And, and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told them not to eat of in the Garden of Eden. And, and they felt ashamed, so they, they were um, trying to cover themselves. Or, and, uh, and God said to Adam, did, did you eat from that tree in the garden that I told you not to eat from? And you remember Adam's response? Uh, it, it was a woman you gave me, God. It, it was that woman that you gave me. She's the one. She forced me to eat it. And God's going, I see. Then he goes to Eve. So did you eat of that tree that I told you and Adam not to eat from? Remember her response? Well, it was the serpent. He made me eat it. The serpent. See, they were blaming. They were making excuses. David didn't do that. He acknowledged. He confessed his sin to God. And to those that were there. And when we talk about confession, what that means is that we're agreeing with God about our sin. God says, you're out of line. You disobeyed. And so we confess. We say, you're right, God. I admit it. You're right. I, I sinned against you. 
it said that after this whole scene happened, David is just probably feeling devastated. He's feeling maybe relieved that the truth finally came out and he can, he can get on with his, with his life physically, emotionally, and most important, spiritually with God. And it seems like being the artist, the poet, the musician that he was, maybe David went off by himself somewhere. Maybe he got his guitar and he, he started to, to write a song or a poem. And, and we have that in Psalm 51. And he's asking God to be merciful to him, to be loving, to forgive him of his sins. And he says this in verses 3 to 4. He acknowledges his sin. He says, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is, is ever before me. He didn't forget about it. Against you, O oh God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now David is starting to walk along the path of forgiveness, which leads us to the next step, and that's that the path to forgiveness leads to repentance. It leads to repentance. Now, now this is where the path to forgiveness gets a little more serious. Um, you know, think of it this way. I mean, it's one thing to put on a parachute, right? It's another thing to jump out of the plane. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to go to Yosemite and look up at the top of Half Dome and say, that looks great. I'm going to climb to the top of it. But it's another thing to get up at 4.30, 5 a.m., get your boots on, your backpack, and your water, and make it to the top, right? I mean, any 49er fans out here? Some 49er fans? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one thing, right, to be a 49er fan. It's another thing to wear your jersey at a Raiders home game, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, the situation gets a little more serious here. And, and that's the same with the path to forgiveness. It's one thing to admit our sin and to confess it before God. But it's another thing then to ha have that lead to, to a repentant heart and changed behavior. You see, forgiveness or repentance is, is more than just a feeling. <clears throat> it's more than just uh, regret. It's, it's actually a change of mind. The, the word in the New Testament actually means a change of mind. That's what repentance <clears throat> literally means. I'm going to define it this way on the board. It's a godly grief for sin that leads to to a change of mind, which leads to a change in actions. You can say to yourself, okay, my mind's changed. I shouldn't be involved in that behavior that's wrong, but if you don't do anything about it, have you repented? No. No. True repentance shows in a change in, in thinking, a change in behavior, in our, in our attitudes, our words, our actions. And there's grief that goes along with it, a godly grief. Um, in our New Testament, we have the book of, of 1 and 2 Corinthians. And they were this Greek church that the Apostle Paul started. And, um, you know, they, they were kind of wealthy. They were um, kind of citizens of, of Rome, of the world at that time. But, but they had trusted Jesus as their Savior. But there was a lot of problems going on in that church. Uh, there was division. Some of them said, you know, I follow this guy or I follow that guy. And they were having church splits and, and they were being selfish with one another. They weren't being kind to the poor. There was uh, immorality. And, and there was basically just rebellion against the Apostle Paul. It was like, who are you to tell us what to do? And so Paul wrote him a scathing letter. <laughs> Paul was convicting them of their behavior and their attitudes. And you know what? God used that letter. By the way, we don't have that letter. In our Bibles, it tells us about it, but we don't actually have the letter, but it moved the Corinthians to not only confess their sins, but to repent. And so it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Paul's writing, and he says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved, what? Into repenting. 
It's not that you are just sorry about your bad attitudes and your behavior. It's that that sorrow, that grief led you to true repentance. For you felt a godly grief. And that needs to accompany our repentance, a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. And we see in Psalm 51, as we go back to it, where David um, communicates, he shares uh, his own grief and his desire to repent and to change. So it tells us in Psalm 51, verse 10, David prays, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, his heart, his heart wasn't clean. <clears throat> It was dirty. It was tarnished with his unconfessed sin. And his spirit was in a wrong place. And he's asking, God, clean me. Clean my heart. Clean my spirit. Change me. And then he goes on in verse 12. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation, O Lord, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Man, there are times... When maybe I've kept my disobedience to myself, I haven't confessed it to God. And if I let that go too long, you know what happens? It really affects my my relationship with with the Lord. It it hurts my relationship with God because I haven't been honest with Him. And that's what David is saying, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And, And then he goes on and closes pretty close, in verse 17. And he really gets down to it. You want to get right with God? God doesn't care about your sacrifices as much. Let me put it in our our terms. Yeah, you can come to church. Okay. You can come to to Bible studies. You can sing the songs, but unless it reflects a repentant heart, it doesn't mean anything. So David writes in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So it's that godly grief combined with the change of mind that leads to a change in our actions. That's the kind of repentance that we experience when we walk down the path to forgiveness. Now, I realize some of you, maybe God's Spirit is speaking to you. You're thinking, man, well, that means things aren't going to be the same if I walk down that road. (laughs) Things are going to change. Yeah, they are. But for the better. For the better. And you'll be glad you went down that path. And finally, the path to forgiveness works through the consequences. Now, we know when there's, you know, when we mess up, when there's sin, when there's disobedience, we can, we can get down on our knees and ask God to forgive us, and the Bible tells us that He will, but there's still the consequences of the actions, right? And so, we've got we've to realize that God can even work through those consequences. And so, as we go back to 2 Samuel In verse 13, David has just confessed that I've sinned against the Lord, he says. And then it goes on. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. Just like that. David was sincere. God forgave him. It didn't take a long prayer. It didn't take days, weeks, months, or years. It happened just like that. Why? Because his heart changed. His heart changed. And God forgave him. Nathan says, you shall not die. The penalty for David's sin, according to the law of the Old Testament, was death. That's what he deserved. If God was fair, that's what would have happened. But God was loving and gracious and merciful to David, just as he'll be gracious, loving, merciful to you and I when we come to him with the right heart. And that's good news, church. That's really good news. Nevertheless, Nathan told him, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord. You just turned your back on him during this sin. 
did what you wanted to do. He loves you, he's forgiven you, but there are consequences. The child who is born to you in Bathsheba will die. That's one of the consequences. We also find that God said the sword will never depart from your family, David. What does that mean? That means that in the, in the weeks, months, and years to come, there would be deceit and treachery and violence and bloodshed within David's own family. And in the end, three of his older sons would be dead. Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah. And yet he was forgiven. You and I are forgiven. It tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He'll forgive us our sins and he'll cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're forgiven. That's the good news that I want you to leave with. Do business with God and you're forgiven. But we do have to deal with the consequences. But you know what? Our God is so big he can even work through the consequences of our forgiven sin. God can do that. I've seen him do it in my, in my own life. But there are those consequences. You know, the student who cheats at school can ask God to forgive him, and he will, but he still might fail the class, right? Or get expelled. Uh, the person at work who, who steals from the cash register, and they get caught, they can ask God to forgive them, but they might get fired. Those are the consequences in face unemployment. The couple who decides to call it quits, God can forgive them, but the children are probably going to suffer. The friend who betrays a close friend and gossips about them and causes pain and hurt, the Lord will forgive and yet, you might lose that friendship. So there are consequences. But our gracious, loving, patient, merciful God can work through those consequences. He can work through any situation, right? With our, with our forgiven sin. Think of it this way. There's, there's no heart too wounded that God can't heal. There's not a relationship too strained that God can't restore. There's, there's not a family too broken that God can't fix. And there's not a life too messed up that God can't redeem. That's what it's about, folks. God is bigger than our sin. He's bigger than our circumstances. And God can work when we come to him humbly. God, after all this with David, after all the, the, the sin and the forgiveness and the consequences, God worked through them. He was loving. He was gracious and merciful to David. He allowed them to come together, and they had another child whom the Lord loved, it says. And he would be the next king, and his name was Solomon. Beauty from the ashes. That's how our God works. That's how our God loves. That's how our God forgives and restores. He loves us all. And he wants us to be in alignment with him. And when we get out of alignment, the Holy Spirit is going to nudge us back in. But we need to take that step on that path and receive. God's forgiveness and move on with the life that he has for each and every one of us. I want to invite you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. I'd like to just give you a little time. Maybe there's, there's something on your heart and you need to do business with God. I would encourage you now to admit it. Admit whatever that disobedience, bad attitude, unforgiving heart, whatever you're hiding, give it to the Lord right now in confession, in repentance. Make a determination to change.